be with you all. Our proclamation of the Holy Gospel tonight is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Almighty God, cleanse my mind, my lips, and my heart, that I may worthily, with dignity, with gentleness, and with love, proclaim your good news to my sisters and brothers. Jesus said to his disciples, Come to me, all you who labor and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. What an exciting, expectant night we have, my sisters and brothers. Our Lord in the Eucharist comes to heal us. So often we look at the church as what we do for God. God instu instituted the church, you know, so we could have something to do for 45 minutes or an hour on Sunday mornings. That's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not our worship of God. The purpose of the church is not our adoration of God. The purpose of the church is not our doing something good for God. The purpose of the church is God doing something for us. He came, he walked our land, and he experienced suffering firsthand at our hands. We wouldn't give him a place to be born. He was born in a dank, damp, dark, dirty stable because we shut our doors. And he suffered willingly. He never worked a miracle to take away his suffering. Even though he was tempted, and that was the temptation of his life. When he fasted in the desert and was hungry, Satan tempted him. Work a miracle for yourself. And he would not. And when we crucified him, and we tempted him in Satan's words. If you're the son of God, work a miracle for yourself. Save yourself and we'll believe in you. But he would not. He suffered willingly at our hands. He experienced all our sufferings. He knew the pain of ingratitude. Did you ever wonder? Were the thousands he fed on Good Friday were? Where were they on Good Friday? John's Gospel tells us they were so impressed with the miracle of the loaves, they were going to take him by force and make him king. Not one of them was heard in Pilate's courtyard to scream out, Don't crucify him. One voice might have changed things. The Gospel tells us Pilate believed he was innocent, was looking for a way to release him. Not one voice on Good Friday. Where were the ten lepers that he cured? Where was the man born blind on Good Friday? Where were those he raised from the dead on Good Friday? He died alone. A few faithful women, one out of twelve apostles, stood by him. He knew the pain of aloneness. He knew the pain of unjust condemnation, unjust suffering. He knew the pain of ridicule, laughter, mockery. And he knew all our physical pains. You want to know his pain? 
Read the old, old book, A Doctor at Calvary. Medical doctors analyzing the sufferings the Messiah went through as he died. He came, he lived in our world, he experienced our suffering, and he didn't want to leave us alone in suffering. Behold, he promised, I will be with you. I will not leave you orphans. I will be with you all days, even till the end of time. Jesus Christ founded the church that we might not be alone on our way of the cross. He predicted, he foretold all the sufferings this world would visit upon us. And he promised, I will be with you. You will not suffer alone. In the church, we have our Simon of Cyrene to help carry our crosses. In the church, we have our compassionate Veronicas. In the church, we meet his mother on our way of the cross. In the church, we have the comforting women of Jerusalem to comfort us on our way of the cross. In the church, Jesus walks with us on our way of the cross. The church is Jesus' gift. I will not leave you orphans. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and find life burdensome. I will give you rest. A healing service is the Lord visiting his suffering people. In the Eucharist, my sisters and brothers, the Lord waits 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, every year of our life. He waits for us to come. In a time of pain, in a time of disillusionment, in a time of suffering, when's the last time we've come to the Lord, thrown ourselves before him, and cried out with the anguish of our hearts, my God, my God, if I've ever needed you before, it's now, God. God, I can't make it without you. Do you know we'd go home with peace? We don't go home with peace because we don't come. We don't come needing him. We run all over the world for healing. We've got the Lord of the universe on our altar. The God of the universe remains physically, sacramentally on our altars. Not so we can do something for him. So he can do for us. He wants to heal us. No one, no theology professor, no bishop, no priest, no theology course, no theology book ever taught me the gift of the Eucharist so much as a Protestant teenage girl the gift of the Eucharist in our healing. I got a call. I was a baby priest, just ordained a couple of months, and my phone rang one morning. And the voice at the other end of the phone said, Is this Father Pat Martin? And I said, It is. Is this the former brother Pat Martin? The voice went on. And I said, It is. Is this the blind brother Pat Martin? And I said, is this the FBI? <laughs> and he... He said, I'm sorry. He said, Father, I just wanted to be sure I was talking to the right man. Well, I said, would you mind telling me what you'd like? He said, I'm John Connors. I worked for AT&T in Boston, and he said, I'm the son of a beautiful woman who's lived with us all our married life. He said, I think the most beautiful compliment 
I could give my mother comes from my own wife. My mom has lived with us throughout our married life and never once interfered in the bringing up of our eight children. She's been a marvelous gift, a grandmother to our kids, but has never interfered. Well, we were looking at Christmas this year, and Connie said to me, John, let's find out what your mother wants, what we could get mom for Christmas this year. Not something that, you know, some trinket that she doesn't need. She's in her 80s, let's get her something that she'd want. And he said, I was so excited. He said, I went up to mom, and I said, mom, if you could have whatever you wanted for Christmas this year, what would you want? And he said, Father, she didn't even hesitate. She said to me, John, don't ask, because you couldn't get me what I want for Christmas this year. Well, he said, Father, those were fighting words. Now I knew there was something she wanted. I wanted to know what it was. I said, Mom, I don't care if I have to mortgage the house. I'll get you what you want. What is it that you want? Connie and I don't want to get you any junk that you don't need. We want to get you something that you'd really like. She said, John, don't ask. You couldn't get me what I'd want for Christmas this year. He said, Mom, I can't get it if you never tell me. Well, I argued with her father until finally she said, Okay, don't tell me that I didn't warn you, but you're going to be disappointed because you won't be able to get me what I'd want for Christmas. If I could have whatever I wanted for Christmas this year, it would be the Mass. He said, Father, my heart fell out of my body. My mom was confined in her little apartment above our home. I'm a telephone man. He said, I had rigged up for the last several Christmases and holidays, closed circuit television, so mom could be with us. We couldn't even carry her down anymore, and she refused to move out of that apartment. So he said, you know, we had her with us as much as we could, but that's all we could do. Get her out for Mass? No way. Get a priest in for Mass in Boston at Christmas? Forget it. Just no way. I knew we couldn't. But I had promised I left her apartment, bound and determined I wasn't going to give up without a try. I went down to the parish. There are four priests in the parish. I talked to them. They said to me benignly, John, it was a beautiful offer on your part, but with Christmas, with all the masses in the parish, all the, the celebration, there's just no way. I told him, I understood there was just, I didn't expect, you know. I, you know, I had to ask because I knew, but, well, I went down to the retreat house, he said, where I go every year. And I asked them, could they come for a mass? And <laughs> there was nobody there. Christmas, they all are farmed out to parishes to help out the busy Christmas schedule. I went to a few priest friends. I'd finally made up my mind that mom was right. I couldn't give her what she wanted. What's number two on your list, mom? I was ready to go up and ask her when suddenly father, he said, I thought of you. You were a brother when you spoke to the phone company, employees who work with the handicapped a few years ago. And he said, ever since then, I've kept in touch. I've gotten your newsletter. And I saw with joy this fall he said that you were ordained a priest. Well, that's why I called. But Father, I want you to know, you can say no. I understand you're a hundred miles away, but you know, I just gotta ask before I tell mom, I can't do it. I said, John, would it have to be on Christmas day? Said, oh no, he said, anytime you can come. In fact, he said, I'll drive down and pick you up and bring you back. I said, come the Sunday afternoon before Christmas. I'll come up and celebrate a mass for your dear mom. I went up that Sunday. John, Connie, their eight grown children, adult children, boyfriends, girlfriends, they were all shoehorned into a little space on mama's floor in her little living room. Everything was set up. We had the ironing board set up as her altar. I told her it was the holiest ironing board in the world. We had everything all set up for mass. And I looked at Mama sitting there like a queen in her big living room chair. And I said, Mama, did you want to go to confession for Mass? Oh, she said, I'd love to. Everybody got up and scrammed and said, call us when you're ready. Well, 
the minute we were alone, Mama said to me, Did you, would you like to know why I wanted the Mass for Christmas? I said, Mama, I'd love to know. She said, Father, I wasn't born a Catholic. In fact, I guess you'd call us one of them black Protestants. Because she said, you know, there was no religion in our home except anti-Catholic. It was drummed into us kids from the time we were little tots that we weren't to associate with Catholics. That Catholics would be our ruin. That if we did dare to associate with Catholics, we were never to bring one home. That was drummed into us, Father, all our growing up years. Well, I grew up a typical teenager. Tell a teenager not to, they're going to do it to find out why they weren't supposed to. I made a couple of Catholic friends at school, and much to my surprise, they weren't much different from me. I couldn't believe it. Well, I began to wonder, and I began to wonder, maybe it was in their church. That was the forbidden territory. So one day after school, I made one of my Catholic friends. I swore her to secrecy and made her take me to her Catholic church. I was so shocked when we walked up the front steps of the church, she reached up and pulled the door open as if she owned the place. She didn't knock. She didn't ring a doorbell. She walked right in. I couldn't believe it. She walked down the front, the, the center aisle, got down on one knee and got into the the bench, I sat down next to her and started looking around at all the pretty pictures, the statues. I'd never seen a stained glass window. I'd never been in the church in my life, Father. Well, I looked all around, and finally she said, my eyes fell on the box. Forgive me, Father, she said, but I didn't know what it was. My eyes fell on the box, and all of a sudden, my friend was hitting me and saying, are you going to stay here all day? I don't know how long I had been staring at the box. But Father, I went home that day with a peace that nothing could touch. Nothing, Father, she said, could touch it. Arguments at home, arguments at school, tests at school, nothing could touch the peace that was in my heart. I began to wonder about it as the days wore on and the peace stayed on. And then the week, finally the peace did wear away. And I began to wonder, was it just emotionalism, my first time in a church? Well, I had to test it. So one day I went back to the Catholic church by myself this time. I remember as I walked up the steps, had my friend had a secret code to open the door? I didn't know. But no, I was delighted. When I pulled and it came open for me. I walked down the same aisle, got into the same bench, looked around at the same pretty windows and pretty pictures and statues, and my eyes fell on the same box. And Father, the peace came back. After that, Father, she said, nobody could keep me from my Catholic church. Are we ashamed? That's a Protestant teenager. Are we ashamed? Nobody, she says, could keep me from my Catholic church. When there was trouble at home, I found my way to the Catholic church. And I found peace. When I had exams that I was worried about, I found my way to the Catholic church. And I found peace. Are we ashamed? Have we come seeking peace? Seeking healing, seeking rest, as he called us. Well, she said, Father, I grew up. I married a man who had no more religion than my own family. He happened to be a doctor. We had the typical marriage problems, except I had one advantage. I would always find my way to the Catholic Church, and I'd find peace. I'd find peace. We moved several times, but every time we moved, I would sneak away ahead of time, look at the house that I knew my husband was looking at, and as long as I could walk from there to a Catholic church, I didn't care what the house looked like. Are we ashamed? We move today, and then we find out where the church is. 
as long as I could walk to my Catholic church, she said. I didn't care what the house looked like. Well, she said, we had our first child, John, whom you know, Father. And then she said I was pregnant for our second child. When one day my husband went to his office and never came home. Father, she cried, that was 60 years ago. Is he dead? Is he alive? I don't know. Do you know what it was like, Father, she said, giving birth to a child? Not knowing if the father was dead or alive. We never knew. We never found out. Disappeared. Father, she said, I brought up those two children. I got a job in a hospital working in a cafeteria. One day, there were two children, two children's pictures on the bulletin board of the hospital. They needed a home. I put my name in, wondering, and would you believe I was accepted to be the mom of those two extra children? So now I had four kids at home as a single mom. The only time I ever hired a babysitter, Father, was so I could have some time to go to my Catholic church. I always cried. I didn't know what prayer was, Father. Nobody had ever taught me about prayer. But I would sit there and look at him in the box and cry my mother's heart out. And I know he understood because I always went home with peace, Father. Are we ashamed, my sisters and brothers? We should be, shouldn't we? Have we ever come hungering to the Lord in the Eucharist that way? We chase around the world for this person, that person, this one, that one. And we've got the Lord of the universe waiting to heal us. Do we let him heal us, my sisters and brothers? Well, she said, Father, the kids grew up. John went off to the Korean War. Every day that he was in Korea, I found my way to my Catholic church. And I cried my mother's heart out. And always I came home with the blessed assurance that he'd take care of my son. And finally, Father, she said, we got the word. We hadn't heard from him in a long time. We didn't know he had gone through the Chosan Reservoir. He made it safely out. And he came home after a year. And we were excited. We had all his favorite foods prepared for the night. It was a big celebration. My daughters and I prepared it all, waiting for him to come home. And he finally arrived. And it was a glorious supper that night. Supper was no sooner finished when my daughters said to me, Mom, you and John got a lot of catching up to do. Go in the living room, close the door. We'll take care of the dishes. I was so excited. The minute I walked into the living room and looked at my John, I knew what he was going to tell me. I knew it, Father. He hadn't said a word, and I knew what he was going to say. He said to me, Mom, you know that I love you, don't you? I said, of course, I know you love me, John. Out with it. What do you want to tell me, John? No, no, Mom. I want you to know that I love you. She said, John, I know you love me. He said, Mom, I want you to know I would never do anything that would hurt you. You believe that, don't you, Mom? She said, John, I do. Please tell me. He said, Mom, I got to Korea, and I needed some answers. I saw soldiers drop dead in front of me, Mom. I saw soldiers drop dead behind me, and I saw soldiers on both sides of me drop dead. And I needed answers, Mom. I didn't know where to turn. We're not Catholic. So I went to the Protestant service. I got no answers. So I talked to the Protestant chaplain. And I got no answers, Mom. One day I talked to the Catholic priest. And I got no answers, Mom. So one day I snuck in to the Catholic service. And I got no answers, Mom. But when I left, I didn't need any more answers. I had peace, Mom. After that, whenever they had Catholic service, I went. And Mom, I always found peace. 
I always found peace. Mom, he cried, would it hurt you if I became a Catholic? Oh, she said, I hugged him and cried. Never had I dreamed that the first human being I would share my secret love affair with the Catholic Church would be my own son, my own flesh and blood. We laughed and cried all night as we shared stories of sneaking into the Catholic Church. The next morning, we shared with my daughters at the breakfast table. That Lent, Father, all of us took instructions. What a joy it was that Easter when we were all baptized, when we were able to bring the Lord home in the box of our hearts and not leave him there in the box. I've learned to call the tabernacle. Father, she said, what a joy it was learning to pray, learning favorite hymns and prayers. It was magnificent, Father. It was just beautiful. Ever since then, Father, I have never missed daily Mass throughout my life until my confinement years. She said, a few years ago, my son came home. It was three in the afternoon when I heard footsteps downstairs. It wasn't his hour to come home from work. I knew it was his footsteps, but there was somebody else's footsteps with him. And what alarmed me is that I knew those extra footsteps, but I couldn't put a name on them. But I knew that I knew them. When they started up my stairway, I don't know why, but I got tense, Father. And when the rap came on the door, and I said, come in, and I saw John's face. He was white as a sheet. I said to him, out with it, John. And she said, I pointed to the crucifix hanging on my wall. He has gotten me through more than you'll ever know, John. He'll get me through whatever news you bring now. What is it, John? Who is it? My doctor was with him, Father. I knew something was wrong. Something was drastically wrong. Is it your Connie? Is it one of the kids, John? He cried as he told me that in the bloodiest murder in Boston's history, my daughter Priscilla had been murdered the night before. Priscilla had gone bowling with the girls from work, a regular work bowling league. Secretary of the league, she had stayed after to fill out the papers and pay the bills. Coming out of the bowling alley alone, she was apprehended by a lunatic who sought to rape her. But she fought for her values. He flew into a rage, jumped on her, killed her, and slaughtered her, ripping the very limbs from the trunk of her body flinging one piece here and one piece there. The police billed it as the bloodiest murder in Boston's history. The man was convicted of first degree murder and after three months in prison took his own life. She said, Father, am I wrong? I don't pray for my daughter Priscilla. Oh, she was no angel. Her own marriage had fallen apart. But Father, she died fighting for her own integrity, the values I had given her, bringing her up. I don't pray for her. I'm sure God had mercy on her with her violent, bloody death. But I pray, Father, am I wrong? I pray for her murderer. I pray, Father, that her murderer may find the peace with her in God's home. Am I wrong, Father? And I cried as I hugged my dear Mama Connors. I said, Mama, if I say you're wrong, then I have to say he was wrong because he prayed for us, his murderers. After that, I never went through Boston without stopping in to celebrate a Mass for Mama Connors as I came to call her. She used to call me her own priest. 
And then she'd add, well, what good is it to have your own priest if he's out gallivanting around the world? And I'd always assure her, Mama, when you need me, I'll be there. Have no fear. Well, the call came March of 1986. Mama had fallen. She'd broken her arm in the fall. She'd been rushed to the hospital and had slipped into a coma. It was merely a broken arm, the doctor said. They couldn't understand why she had sunk into a coma. And she had not come out of the coma. I was preaching missions on the northern prairies of Western Canada, about four and a half hours from the nearest airport, when John Connors called. He said, Pat, Mom hasn't come out of the coma for four or five days. The doctors don't give her a 10% chance of making it through the night. They told us to call the next of kin, and we knew we had to call her priest. I realize where you are. I've looked it up on the map. You're never going to make it home in time, but I wanted you to know. I said, John, you go to Mama, lean close to her good ear, and tell her her priest will be home on Friday. This was Tuesday. <clears throat> My mission ended Thursday night. I said, tell her her priest will be home on Friday. He said, Pat, she's not going to make it. They told us 10% chance of getting through today. I said, just do as you're told. And I always gave Mom a prayer assignment when I left her. I said, I've got another one for you, John. My sister Martha, one of the 22, was going through cancer at that point, and she was in a particularly bad crisis at that moment. I said, tell Mama that I want her to pray during her crisis for my sister Martha in her cancer crisis. He said, I'll tell you, but call tomorrow. I called the next day, and Mama had made it through the night. I said, John, you go. This is Wednesday. Tell Mama her priest will be home day after tomorrow, and please keep praying for Martha. Thursday, I called. Ran right up to the ward. Mama was in a semi-private room. Walked past the first bed and over to Mama's bedside, and I leaned close to her good ear, and I said, Mama, your priest is home. And Mama, who by that time had been in a coma for almost 10 days, Mama, who hadn't eaten in over 10 days, Mama, who was in her late 80s by that time, sat up in bed, lifted both arms, including the one in the cast, opened her eyes, and said to me, How's Martha? <clears throat> From one of the airports that day, I had called and had gotten good news of Martha. And so I told Mama and thanked her for her prayers. Mama laid back on her pillow and did not die that night. Everybody was sure now that her priest was home, she would die. But she did not die that night. What fools we were. Mama wasn't waiting for her priest. The next morning, we arrived at the hospital to find Mama beaming. She had seen her daughter Priscilla the night before, and she had seen her mother. She said they were so happy as they wait for me. And Mama didn't die that day. John and I were in the waiting room letting others visit Mama, and John said, I don't know who Mama's waiting for. He said, you know, I keep asking her, who do you want to see, Mom? She keeps saying, everybody. He said, you know, if we could get a private room, and if we could move Mom safely to a private room, I'd get the whole family in. Well, I said, if your ifs come true, I'll run down to the local rectory, get everything I need for Mass, and let's have another Mass for Mama. We no sooner finished our ifs, I mean seconds after we finished our statements, the phone in the waiting room rang with the administrator of the hospital. He said, Mr. Connors, We've got a private room. Do you think your mother could survive the move? We said, let's try. Mama survived the move. We got her settled. We got the whole family in there. The local parish was fantastic, giving me everything I needed for Mass. We set up a little altar right next to Mama's good ear. 
and we had mass that night with all of Mama's surviving relatives. It was just magnificent. It came the end of mass, giving Mama the last Holy Communion of her life. As I was cleaning up the vessels after communion, I suddenly realized what was going to happen, who Mama had waited for. I cleaned up all the vessels, put everything away, said the communion prayer, and then turned to Mama. I gave her the final blessing of her life, and I said, Mama, your Mass is ended. Go in peace. And Mama died that night. She had waited one more time for her Lord in the Eucharist. My sisters and brothers, are we ashamed? Have we waited for our Lord that way? We throw God out of our lives because of suffering. We throw Him out of our lives when we watch our children suffer, when we watch our parents suffer, when we watch our brothers and sisters suffer. If that's the way it is, we say, and we throw religion, we throw God out of our lives. We blame Him for what we ourselves would never do. We don't even give Him credit for being as good as we are. When's the last time in that suffering we've come and thrown ourselves on our disillusioned knees before the Lord and cried with all the anguish of our hearts, My God, my God, I can't make it without you. I need you, God. Be my healing. Be my strength in weakness. Be my safety in danger. Be my sight in blindness. Be my hearing in deafness. Be my joy in sadness. Lord, be my comfort in sorrow. Be my strength in weakness. Lord, be my life in death. My sisters, my brothers, as we gather before the Lord this night, I ask you to bring all the prayer petitions that you brought with you to this healing service. You didn't bring them to give them to father or sister. We aren't healers. The Lord of the universe right here before us is our healer. I beg you, now, give the Lord all the healings that you want. He said, come to me, all you who labor and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. He said, whatever you ask me, I will give to you. He didn't say, Father Pat will give it to you. He said, I will give it to you. Ask, he said. Up to now, he said, you've not asked me. I say to you, ask always. I'm sorry. That you may receive, that your joy may be full. Well, let us ask the Lord tonight. Give him all the healings that you want in this time. I think I ate up too much time. Probably ate mine and sisters and everybody's. But uh, I want to give sister a chance. We're going to... I've just been informed we're going to go straight into benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. My sisters and brothers, as you are blessed, not by me, but by our Lord in the Eucharist, as you are blessed, lift up to the Lord all the healing, all the peace, all the favors that you want. Lift them up with faith, with expectation, and know that God doesn't break his promises. 
He promised He will keep it. Lift up your needs to Him and receive. I have just one note of uh, explanation. I do not use incense with benediction because if I do, you won't have me around too long. I have a bad allergy. Smoke starts polyps growing in my sinus cavity. Last time they were removed, they were seven centimeters long between the sinus and the windpipe. So we, I have no choice but to avoid smoke. Uh, so we let our song and our praise be the incense that rises to the Lord. And as we sing our benediction hymn, preparing your heart all the favors you want from your Eucharistic Lord. Thank <laughs> you.